So welcome from welcome back from the break. Um, so I hope everybody had a very nice break. Uh, we're going to continue from where we left off last time, which is uh, foundation of statistical learning. So just a reminder, right? If everybody remember what we talked about last time, to simplify matters, we one of the essential concepts we talked about last time is the difference between in sample error and out of sample error. Let's give you, suppose these are, these are the underlying data, right? Okay, I'm just assume, so I'm just going to assume that there exists an Y and an X, and I'm going to assume that this is basically the underlying data that we have. But I only observe this data, I observe, this data I observe, uh, this data observe, maybe these two data observe, okay? Uh, maybe let's say I also observe, um, you know, this one, okay? So the, so the yellow part is the, is the data that I actually observe. The white part is the underlying data. Given any hypothesis, remember what a hypothesis is? Like this is a hypothesis, right? This is my this is my hypothesis of the underlying relationship between x and y. So given any hypothesis, I can make errors. Here is the, the, the error that I make in the underlying data. Right? So this is, a, this is an error, this is an error, this is an error, this is an error. Right? So these are the errors I'm making in the, in the underlying data. The error I make in the underlying data, we call it E out of H, right? out of sample, out of sample error. Uh, there are many, many different names. There are auto sample error, prediction error, true error, expected error, whatever you, you know, whatever you have you, right? So there are many, many different names. We're going to stick out, stick with out of sample error. The error I make on the data I actually observe, which are these errors, I call them the in sample error. Okay. Now the in sample error is also called empirical error. Again, many different names. Um, or oh, training error, or oh, this is test error. Okay. So, what is our goal in choosing a model? And what is our goal in estimation? Our goal in choosing a model and learning is we want to, choose, we want to find out a hypothesis that, is, that describes the underlying data well. Meaning, we want to find a hypothesis so that E out, the out of sample error, is as close to zero as possible want our H to fit the underlying data. Unfortunately, we do not see the underlying data. Right? Everything we see is on this data we actually observe, which is the in sample error. This is what we can actually calculate. This is something that we want to drive down to zero. Now, in order to drive down to zero, but based on, but I only see this, how do I do? Well, I try to find an H that, first of all, the first thing is I try to find an H such that E in, the in sample error of H, is almost zero, right? That's the first step. Find something to describe the in sample error well. The second step is I want to make sure that my in sample error is almost the same as my out of sample error. In other words, I want to make sure that whatever I can calculate on the in sample error is close enough or tells me enough about the out of sample error. Now, if these two conditions are satisfied, then I am pretty confident that I have something that makes the underlying out of sample error almost zero. Right, so these are the two steps we have. Now, last time we end up with this expression, which is the whole thing inequality. Uh, I see here, right? This whole thing inequality. Um, let me just write it. Hoping you would include tells that the probability between the E out and the E in, both of H, right, of a hypothesis, the absolute value, now to the epsilon is smaller than 2 e to the 2 minus epsilon squared n. What does this inequality tell us? It says that, first of all, we have this n. It says that if n goes up, what happens? Now, n is the number of data points I have, which is the number of the yellow dots I have. Now, it says the more data I observe, this thing becomes smaller, right? Which means that 
they become E and E out are closer, right? right? So when this thing becomes smaller, it means that the probability that these two, the difference is larger than epsilon becomes smaller, meaning that they, bec they become closer, right? They become closer. So the higher, the more the end, the larger the, in other words, the larger the data set, the more my E in can tell me about my E out. So, you know, or put it another way, if you, if you already have a calculated E in, then the larger the data set, the more your sample, the larger your sample size, the more you can be confident that the underlying E out is pretty close to what E in you have. Now, I think that's, a, that's a something that everybody understands, right? The larger the data set, the better, right? The more sample size we have, the more merrier our results are more precise, the law of larger numbers, that's exactly what this is talking about. How about, um, right, so this is, this is what it is. Now, un unfortunately here, we are, this formula, this whole thing equality, only applies if we are talking about a fixed H. So I give you a hypothesis, like this one, and we can write down this whole thing equally. But suppose this H is not given to you. Suppose this H is picked from a larger set, right? So instead of giving you an H, I give you a large set H, which contains H1 all the way to Hm, okay? Right. So I have H1 to Hm, there are n different hypotheses. And what I do is I will always pick one of them, and then I calculate my E. In this case, the whole thing equality no longer holds. And the, and the intuition behind that, as explained last time, is that if I give you a lot of coins, and every time you try to pick one coin, that always give you the heads, right? Or I give you a lot of different choices, a lot of different choices, and you always pick the one that performed the best on this, on this observed data, then the result, your e in is going to be inaccurate, more inaccurate, doesn't reflect the E-out anymore. I'll give you a complicated, and again, the example is if I give you a complicated enough model, like if I give you a large hypothesis set that contains all the functional form uh, we have, right, any functional form you want, then you can always, you can always pick a hypothesis, hypothesis that makes zero E. You can always do that. Always pick hypothesis that makes zero E. Does it, does it mean that this hypothesis describes the underlying data well? No because this hypothesis you're picked, right? You're always picking this one out of a large set to intentionally fit these observed data. So the e in is no longer have a, this very tight relationship with the yacht. In that case, the whole thing equality here in this form doesn't apply anymore. So in this class, what we try to do is we try to introduce a modification to this inequality so that we still can express something about the e in from e in to e out. So here's how we're going to do it. Right? It's actually pretty simple. If I give you a hypothesis set containing H1 to Hn, so M hypothesis, and I'm going to pick a G, so G is one of them, okay? I don't know which one. G is one of the, of the H. I'm going to pick a G, and I'm going to calculate E in G uh, on, the, on the observed data. My question is, what is E out? What is E out? Well, what we can do is I can write the whole thing equality just like before, but with a little bit of modification. And I say is the probability okay, of E in this G, now this G is picked from this H, right? Okay. Minus E out G, larger than epsilon. Now, this probability, the probability that they, the difference is larger than epsilon, is, what we can try to do is, is, is what? Is smaller than, um, actually let me explain this one. If I tell you that the E in and the E out, the difference of this G is larger than epsilon, what can you deduce? Well, we know that this G is picked from this H. So if E in and the E out G is larger than epsilon, then that means at least one of the H, right, is the difference like because G comes from, right? So if G, if this, if this one is larger than epsilon, then at least the difference in one of them is larger than epsilon. Now, I don't know which one, because I just give you an H, and you pick one of, you, 
So, I, so, so from my perspective, I just give you the luggage, and you pick a G out of it. I don't know how you pick. I don't care how you pick. I just know that you pick the G out of BH. So if the G has different larger than epsilon, then from my perspective, I know that at least one of the H is larger than epsilon. So in other words, either H1, okay, either E in, so either E in H1 minus E out H1 is larger than epsilon, sorry. So either H1 is larger than epsilon, or, okay, or E in H2, uh, H2, okay, is larger than epsilon. So either H1 is larger than epsilon, or H2 is larger than epsilon, or, or EM, right, or HM is larger than epsilon. So at least one of them has to be larger than epsilon, if this happens, if this is true. Right, so, you know, simple logic. So how do I express this in terms of probability? Now, if this thing happens, if I know this is true, then at least one of them is true, right? Either or, 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 then I can say this, right? I can say the probability of this thing happening is smaller than the probability of this thing happening plus the probability of this happening plus the probability of this happening. Everybody follow that? Is that, is that clear? Right? So remember, right, this is a very simple probability. Remember that if event A, if event A implies B, right, B is, you know, uh, then I can write probability of A is smaller than the probability of B, right? Okay, I know that. So if this is true, then at least one of them is true, then I can write the probability of this is smaller than the probability of this event plus this event plus this event plus this event. This is, the, this is the most lax way we can write it. In other words, if we assume that H1 to HM are all independent, then this is exactly the formula we have. But if they overlap, they're not independent, I can still write this because it's a smaller than. It's a smaller than. Okay. So this probability that G has this E and E out larger than epsilon is always smaller than every one of them is smaller than epsilon, is larger than epsilon, right? Just probability plus. Now, Every one of them is, is essentially the same because every one of them is, is I can use the whole thing equal, right? So let's go back. For every one of them, for example, for this one, this is H1. For every one of them, that's a single hypothesis, which I can use this whole thing inequality to bound it. So every one is smaller than 2e minus 2 epsilon square n. In other words, the total G is becomes becomes n because we have n different hypotheses. It becomes n times the two e minus two epsilon square n. That's it. That's the modified whole thing equal. So once the G is picked from n different hypotheses, and I don't care how it's picked. You, you could pick it by minimizing E in. You could pick it by just randomly drawing a G from H. I don't care. I just know that G is picked from H. Now, as long as G is picked from H, I can write this. The probability of G being in the E out is larger than epsilon is smaller than the big M times this original whole thing equal in bound. The only difference here is we're timing we're times this big M, which is how many hypotheses there are in this hypothesis set. All right, now that looks simple enough. And what I'm going to do is, okay, but that gave us the famous generalization bound, okay? So, um, so I'm going to write it. Now I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of mathematics, right? So I'm going to say, let this whole thing, I'm, just call, I'm going to call it delta. Okay. The delta equal to this whole thing. Now, if the probability of an event, which is this thing, right, this event, the probability of event is smaller or equal to delta, what can we do? So with probably at least one minus delta, this thing will happen. That's our final conclusion from our little derivation. Now, what that means is if this delta is small enough, 
then we have very high probability that this will happen. In other words, with high probability, our E out will always be smaller than E in plus this thing. Okay? Plus this. Now this is called a generalization bound. Why is it called generalization bound? Because this essentially provides a bound to how close these two things are. E in from E out. And what does this bound depend on? This bound depends on, first of all, the n. Now, the larger the n, meaning the more data sets we have, data points we have, the closer the yin and the out. That's again the point I just made. If you have a large data set, then your yin sample error and out sample error are very close. Uh, but what about but this new thing, okay? This is new. The previous one, when we talk about Hopkins inequality, the original Hopkins inequality, there's no this m. Now we have this new thing called m here. What is m? m is how many hypotheses we have in our big H, right? Remember, the big H is H1 to Hn. So M is how many hypotheses there are in the, in the big H. So the larger the M, what happens? The far away E in from E out, correct? This, when this M goes up, this thing become larger, meaning E in and E out become larger, because E out is e in, smaller than E in plus, right? So this bound becomes larger, essentially. So the larger the M, the, the loser, the, the more, the less E out can tell you something about E. That's the expression. But you can intuitively can understand it as the larger the M, the, the, the essentially E out is more far away, right? The bound is loser. You can understand it as E out is far more far away from E. Yeah, that okay. Now, this M is also what we call the complexity of our model. Because why? Because we, this M is how many hypotheses there are in this big H. So a more complicated model is a model with more hypotheses, correct? If I have a model that only, like only two hypotheses, that's a simple model. If I model I have 10,000 hypotheses, that's a very, that's, that should be more complicated than a hypothesis with only, only two, uh, two models, right? Only two hypotheses. Uh, the linear model, again, the linear model is a simple, is a relatively simple model. A model like this is more complicated model, right? But this model, right, this model, let's, let me call it H2, this linear model, let me call it H1, this model have more hypotheses than H1. Because why? Because in this model, it, it, you know, if basically this model should incorporate the H1, right? Incorporate the linear model. So the linear model have less hypotheses. So typically, the more hypotheses you have, the more complicated your model is. And what this inequality is telling us is that the more hypothesis you are, the more complicated your model is, the less your E out will tell you something about it. So your E out and E in are more far away from each other. Okay, generalizing bound. Now, what does it actually mean? Right? How does it relate to what is the whole story? Why do we do this exercise? And what is the whole story of this thing? Again, remember, when we do data analysis, our goal is to find a hypothesis such that we can make the E out close to zero but we only see yin. So we're going to do two steps. One step is we're going to try to find a hypothesis that make yin as close to zero as possible. The second step is we're trying to make yin and yi out. We're trying to guarantee that yin and yi out are very, very close to each other, so that when yin is zero, yi out is zero. Right? So, you know, that's the two steps. Now what this generalization bound, this is called a generalization bound. Right? What this generalization bound tells us is that if you pick a hypothesis from a very large set, from a very complicated model, then your e in and e out are probably not going to be very close. It's harder for them to be close because this generalization bound is loser. Okay? Right. Let me show it again. So imagine, imagine this is your e. In. This is what you see. But what is your e out? Your e out is somewhere in this region. So your E out could be here, could be here. This is your bound, okay? So this is essentially what this is. This is the generalization bound. Now, the larger the M, the more complicated your model is, this bound has become larger. It becomes this. The smaller the M, the bound becomes tighter. If the bound is tight, then you know your E in is E out is very close to E. In. If the bound is larger, your E out could be very far away from E. In. So again, this all depends on two things. The first thing is n, the complexity of the model in which you pick your hypothesis. The second is the n, your data, your data points. 
the more if let's fix it, right? If suppose we have a fixed data set, the n is fixed. Then the question is, should you choose a more complicated model or should you choose a simple model? Right? Now if that's the question, then the only thing we need to care about is this n. Should we choose a more complicated model or should we choose a simpler model? A more complicated model has a higher m. The simpler model has a smaller m. Now according to this formula, it looks like we should choose a simpler model because that gives you a tighter bound. No, not actually, not really. Because that's only one part of the story. Remember, we have two things we want to satisfy. Right? What are two things again? Sorry. We have two things. The first goal, the first goal is we want our e in to be almost zero. We want to drive e into zero. The second is we want our e out to be almost similar to e in. Okay? Right, these are two goals. So if you make your model simpler, then according to our results here, your generalization bound is closer, right? So your e out and e in are very, very similar. So we achieve we achieve which goal? We achieve the second goal, right? So choosing a all I'm saying is that we are, let's let's fix our data set size, let's fix n, and we're considering w w the complexity of model, then if we choose a simple model, then e and e out are closer to each other. So we achieve this step, but however, if you use a simple model, then your e in is going to is likely to be more than zero, right? Your e in is going to be larger. Look at look at our example previous look at our previous example. Um, okay, I think this is probably a better way to do it. I just use too too bad word because I can take it out any time, right? So remember our previous example. So this is the underlying data. Underlying data, and these are the data that actually observe. Right? Yeah, actually. Now, if I use a simple model, like a linear line, right, linear regression, then what I can do is this. Now, if I use a very simple model, then I can be sure I can sure that the e out and e in are pretty close to each other because the m is small. But it makes a lot of in sample error, right? So the e in is large not equal to zero. If I use a really, really complicated model, if I use a model like this, right, if I use a model like this, what happens? I can make E in close to zero. But because the model is not more complicated and become larger, my E out is going to be more far away from my E in. So here is the trade-off. Right? In other words, when it comes to model complexity, what kind of model do you want to choose? Do you want to choose a complicated model? Do we want to choose a simpler model? There is this trade-off. This trade-off between choosing a more complicated model to make E in really, really small, and choosing a simpler model so that I know that E in and E out are closer to each other. And that's always a trade-off we need to face. Okay? And there's a name for that trade-off. It's called the approximation generalization trade-off. It's actually later on in the slides. Let me go here. Okay. Right. okay. So as you can see on the slides, right, the trade-off is called approximation generalization trade-off. Now, what do I mean by approximation? Approximation means I can try to get e in as good as to zero, as as close to zero as possible. I can try to approximate the relationship on my observed data as much as possible, that's called approximation. But if you do approximation too well, you make e in exactly zero, then your m, your model is very complicated, then e in and e out are going to be far away. In this case, we say the model do not generalize well. By generalize, I mean how close, e, how much you can, you can, you can, how much you can infer about e out from e in, okay? So if, if, I, if based on e in, I have a very good idea about e out, we say your model generalize well. If your e in is very far away from e out, then we say your model does not generalize very well. So there, there is this trade-off between approximation and generalization. You can always try to make your fit of the observed data better and better and better, making e in closer and closer to zero, but then maybe your model will generalize worse and worse and worse. Right? On the other hand, you can always try to make your model generalize really well by choosing a really, really simple model but on the other, you know, but that, that will make you approximation really bad. 
in a sense, you have very high yield. So we always try to find, we need to try to find a balance between the two, right? So we always have this, okay? So this is a, this is a graph that we always see again and again, that this is the out of sample error. Out of sample error is the true error, right? It's the error in the underlying population that we really care about. We want to minimize this out of sample error. Now, if I, if I increase my model complexity, then what I have is I can, so this is complexity. If I make my model more complicated, my in sample error, E in, will be decreased and decreased and decreased as I choose more and more and more complicated model because I have more capacity to fit each data, right? But as we make E in smaller and smaller, our model complex, well, this is the, this red line essentially is this, gen is this, okay? This is our red line. So the red line is this generalization bound. So as our model become more and more complex, the generalization bound become higher and higher and higher, larger and larger. So E and E are more and more far away. So the out of sample error actually increase in the end, right? Now our goal is to find this golden point, which is this middle point where the out of sample error is the minimum. So we, we should not choose a model that's too simple. If the model is too simple, our E is too high. If we, if we choose a model too complex, then the generalization bound is too loose. E out and E are too, are too far away. So we must choose somewhere in between where they strike a nice balance to find out the minimum out of sample error. Now, for those of you who have uh, followed my introduction, this is a graph that you should probably be familiar with because that's exactly the message I talk about in my introduction, right? When we talk about model selection, which is a simple model, complex model, we need to find a point where the auto sample is the minimum. Too complicated, not good. Uh, too simple, not good. We're just basically using a mathematical expression to formally express the idea here, right? using the generalization bound. So that's a, that's a pretty simple. Um, but uh, there's something a little bit more complicated here. And uh, I won't spend much time on it because that's not essential. I was trying to, I would try to explain a little bit and we can go ahead, all right? Now, one of the things that in my, ex in my mathematical formula here, uh, by the way, in my slides, uh, the M is this, okay? This is, this is actually M, the size of H. Now, one of the things you can see here is M is what I call model complexity. And M formula in our model is how many H there are in this big H, right? How many hypotheses in the big H? But uh, this is assuming that we have a finite H, right? Or a finite hypothesis. In reality, most models that we ever consider, think about the linear model. A linear regression model is what? What is a linear regression model? A linear regression model is y equal to, let's just say one dimension, okay? One dimensional. Beta zero plus beta one x. And the beta can take any value, right? So how, so the big H, so this is the big H. What is a small h? Small h is anything that give a, give a, de give a concrete value to beta. So, so y equal to uh, one plus three x, Right? This is a small h. So this big H contains many, many small h, right? How many hypotheses there are in this model? Infinite. Now, uh, so, this h, so this m is infinite. If this m is infinite, what happens to this bound? It becomes useless, right? It's essentially useless bound. Now let's think about uh, the quadratic model, okay? So the quadratic model is beta two x squared, right? The quadratic model compared with the linear model is clearly more complicated. Everybody agree? Linear model is just a line. Quadratic can take many different shapes, including the line. So you would agree that the quadratic model is more complicated than the linear model. But how many hypotheses there are in a quadratic model? Infinite. So both are infinite. Both have m equal to infinity meaning our bound here is useless. It doesn't really tell me about the complexity of the models and it's unable to bind the in and out. So in other words, uh, using the number of hypotheses as a measure of complexity is a pretty bad idea, okay? We don't want to do that because most models have infinite number of hypotheses. So we need to find another way to measure complexity, how complex a model is. Now this is a large topic, 
And essentially, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the key ideas we're going to introduce is to use something called a VC dimension as a measure of model complexity. Uh, I'm not going to go to a lot of detail. If you're interested, you can, so from my slides, you can click on appendix, because I have an appendix, right? Click on appendix, and the appendix contains uh, some more detail in introduction about VC dimension and you know how do we measure model complexity. But right now, let's just, let me just uh, give you some very easy uh, idea about model complexity, okay? Now, how do we measure model complexity for, uh, for hypotheses that contain infinite number of hypotheses? Well, imagine Imagine I have two points. Imagine our y is only minus one and plus one, okay? Y only has two value, plus one, minus one, that's it. Okay, all right. So any hypothesis we consider, any model we consider, is a model that describes when y is plus one, when y is minus one, right? That's any hypothesis, any, it does that. Now imagine I give you two points. One point is, plus one, one point is minus one, okay? Now, if my hypothesis is, I give you a hypothesis that's called a st the linear model. So linear model in, in uh, suppose we have x1, x2, x2, 1, x2, so we have two dimension x, and these are two points on a two dimension x. <coughs> so one, is, one has a y value, y equal to plus one, y equal to minus one. Now, um, if I give you a linear model, like this one, a linear model in a two dimension is a line like this, right? That's a linear model. This model says, this model says here, every, everything here is minus one. Everything here is plus one. That's what a linear model can do in two dimension. So using this linear model, I'm able to say, I'm able to classify, I'm able to say this point is plus one, this point is minus one. There's no problem, okay? All right, what about what about if I have three points? Suppose now I have this, I have a point like this, okay? Um, and here, y is also equal to minus one. Can I use a linear model to help me correctly predict these two, these, these three y? Yes, I can, I can. I can use a model like this, right? And it says here it's plus one, here's minus one. If I do that, I will be able to correct, correctly classify all three points. Okay, all right. Uh, what if, uh, what if we're here? What if, uh, let me say, y equal to, what if we have here? y equal to plus one, but here y equal to minus one. Okay, so minus one, minus one, plus one. And they're on a single line. Can I find a linear model that will be able to correctly classify all three points. Can you do that? Think about it, can you do that? Maybe I can do a linear model like this that says minus one here, plus one here, but that's not really, right? I can, uh, I can do like this, but <laughs> that doesn't do anything. I can do this. No way, right? So in order to use a model to correctly classify these three points, I cannot use a linear model. I have to use what? I can use many things, but I, can, I have to use a more complicated model. That's the, that's the message. So I have to use something like, so I have to use something like this, right? Which says, which says this region is plus one, this region is minus one. So if I use this more complicated model, I'm able to correctly classify these three points. Okay? So that's how we measure model complexity. So the idea of model complexity is how we measure it. We measure it by saying, how essentially how much our model can create different patterns in the data. The linear model can only create, the linear model can only create minus one plus one. It's a very simple pattern, right? Now this model can create more complicated math pattern so that they can classify, correctly classify more data points, more different, different data points patterns. So that's why it's a more complicated model. Right. Now mathematically, how do we do that? We say, uh, let's see, um, let's, let's take a look at, uh, 
Uh, full points, okay. Yeah. Full points. Actually, let me. Yeah. So, suppose we suppose we get full points. Now, suppose I say y equal to y equal to minus one here, minus one here, plus one here, plus one. Here. This is called one dichotomy. So this is a word. So this is called a one dichotomy. Each dichotomy is actually is, is actually is, is a sing, is a single combination of plus one and minus one. So this is one dichotomy. If I change one value, that's a different dichotomy. So each each dichotomy is one single arrangement of plus one and minus one. Now, if I give you a linear model, how many dichotomies you can create in uh, for these four points? I can create I can create this one. Can I create this one? Yes. I can use this linear model to create this dichotomy, right? Um, can I create uh, can I create minus one, minus one, plus one, plus one? Yes, right? Obviously. Can I do plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one? I can do that, okay? That's also a dichotomy I can do. Can I do plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one? Can I do that? Is a linear model? Would I be able to do that? No, okay, no. That is a dichotomy you cannot create. All right, so the maximum number of dichotomies, how many dichotomies you can create, is a measure of complexity, okay? And that's called a growth function. We have a name for it, it's called a growth function, right? So growth function, now formally, we use growth function as m, okay, m, the h, n, as a growth function, but you don't have to care about it, right? So the growth function of a, of a model h is on n, right? This is the growth function of a model h on n points is the maximum number of hypotheses we can create and on those n points. And that's a measure of complexity, all right? So, but another question is how many, how many dichotomies total? How, what is the total maximum number of dichotomies on four points? How many dichotomies there are on four points? It's very easy. Look, there are two possibilities, right? Plus one, minus one, right? <coughs> so two possibility, plus one, minus two possibility, two, two. So it's two to the fourth, right? Two to the fourth possibilities, which is 16, right? So there should be 16 different dichotomies. The linear model, can the linear model create all 16 dichotomies? No. Because we know at least, for example, this dichotomy it cannot create. Right? So we are going to say VC dimension, we're going to define something called a VC dimension. VC dimension, by the way, so we have if we have n points, then the total number of dichotomy is called a 2 to the n. Right? Total number. So VC dimension means the VC dimension of a model refers to the maximum of data points in which the model can create all possible dichotomies. So this is a long word, right? This is a long word. So um, essentially it means how many data points? Like these four data points. You know, four data points, can you use a linear model to create all different dichotomies? No, we cannot do that. On three points, on three data points, like here, one, two, three. On three data points, can we use a linear model to create all dichotomies? On these three data points, yes. Okay, plus one, minus one, minus one. Yes, we can do that. Minus one, plus one, plus one. Yes, we can do that. Okay, any dichotomy you can create on these three data points, we can we can we can use a linear model to do that. So, for linear model, the VC dimension is three, because three data points is the maximum number of data points on which you can create all possible dichotomies. When we go to four data points, it can no longer do that. So VC dimension is a measure of model complexity. Growth function is also a measure of model complexity, right? Growth function is how many you can create on n points. VC dimension is what is the maximum number of points you can create all possible dichotomies. They're essentially synonyms, right? They're essentially very, very similar. They all, in fact, we can find a mathematical relationship between these two. We can, uh, almost, you know, we can, we can find it, I'm uh, showing the slides, but they are both measures of measure of model complexity. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use VC dimension and a growth function. We're going to use these concepts 
to replace the big M. So this is this is the big M, right? So this is our generation bar. This big M is a measure model complexity. But now I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to replace it with growth function or VC dimension because they are a true measure. They are, they are better measure model complexity when we our model is infinite, right? Okay. So the results is here, right? This is the result. Actually, let me. We can write out this inequality. Remember, previously in our inequality, this is the big M. Now we're replacing this big M with the growth function. Growth function is a measure model complexity, like I just explained, right? So that's the amount of the amount of dichotomy you can create on endpoints. There's a little bit change here, right? There's no there's no two, and there's a two is becomes one A. But but the essential the essential element is the set. And this inequality is called the VC inequality. Okay, the Vapnik uh, Chobodankis inequality. Basically, people call it VC inequality. Right. Okay. Now, the VC inequality from this equation, we can write it in this form. There, there is the equivalent, which is with, with probability at least one minus delta, I can write E out is smaller than E in plus this generalization bound. So this is our new generalization bound. In this generalization bound, the growth function replaced the original M as a measure of uh, model complexity. Now it turns out that the growth function has a relationship with the DC dimension. They, are, they, are, you know, they have this very nice relationship where the growth function is smaller than N to, N to the, uh, the uh, VC dimension plus one, right? Which means I can write it this way. So E out is more than E in plus this thing, where here we use essentially the VC dimension. The VC dimension is called DVC. DVC is our VC dimension. All right. Okay. Now that's so much for uh, for my results, right? If you want to go into detail, you can again look at the slides, go into appendix, and review the math. But the essential message here basically is exactly the same as before. We're just replacing the M with a new measure of complexity, which here is the VC dimension, right? And remember, VC dimension essentially is a measure of how, what is the maximum, what is the largest data set uh, a, a model can create all possible dichotomies on, right? So which is a measure of complexity for infinite models, for infinite hypothesis set. But the message is exactly the same. The message is, if you use a more complicated model, your VC, the model's VC dimension goes up then the generalization become worse, okay? E out and E are far away, far, more far away, if you use a more complicated model. But if you use a more complicated model, you can try to get the E in close to zero. It's always the same. If you use a simple model, then your E in is more likely to be high, but, right, but the generalization bound becomes tighter. So this bound becomes smaller if you use a simpler model because the VC dimension becomes smaller, right? So essentially the same message as before. We are just using a fancy term to describe model complexity. All right. Okay. All right, now let's come back to uh, uh, a point that I will also revisit later in this course, which is remember in our uh, introduction, I said one of the practices that data science do today is to divide your data into two parts. One is training, the other is test. Right. So you essentially have a, you, you, if you begin with a data set, you divide into two parts and you keep one part never touched. Okay? So the training and the test data practice, suppose this is all your data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide it like this, and I'm going to use this part for training and this part for test. The test data is almost never touched until the last step. The training data is where you fit your model. What do I mean by fit my model? It means I give you a big H that consists of many small h, right? And we're going to pick one of them as our G. So G is our chosen hypothesis to fit the data. But how well does the G perform? Well, I bring G to the test data, okay? And I see how well this G performs on the test data. And to see how what's, what's that, right? Using a linear, again, using linear model as example, this H can be a linear model. This h can be y equal to 
beta 0 plus beta 1x, where beta can be anything, right? What is the, and then I fit this model on the training data, so from which I get a g. So what is g? You know, let me just give you something. Suppose minus 1 plus 3x, okay? Suppose this is the optimal hypothesis we pick from, from the h, right? And this is our g, okay? Now the problem is, what is the error made by g? If I can calculate this error, I can calculate the error of g on a training data, which will give me e in g, okay? Give me e in g. Now I can also bring this g to the test data and I calculate how well this g performs on the test data, in the sense that how well it can, use, it can be used to predict y in the test data. If I do that, it will give me an e, I will call it, I will call it e test, okay? The test error of g. Error that G makes in the test error. Now the question is, which one is closer to E out? Is E in closer to E out, or E test closer to E out? Suppose the n is the same. Suppose the the number of data is n here, and the number of data is n here. Right? We divide our data into two parts. In that case, is E test closer to G uh, E out? Because we ultimately we only care about E out, right? So is E test closer to E out, or E in closer to E out? What do you think? Now, of course, you know that the reason, that the only reason people do this is because they believe E test is better, right? You know, at the, at the underlying intuition, as I explained in my introduction, is that we don't care how well a model performs on your training data. We care about how well the model performs on a data you never see before. That's my intuition. But mathematically, why is E test better? Why is E test closer to E out than E? Okay. The answer is this. Sorry. The answer is what is the what is the, what is the e in what is the relation between e and e out? Well, suppose I'm going to let's suppose the h is finite, okay? So I'm going to suppose h is h is finite again, and that's n hypothesis, right? Just to make things easier for you. So if this is the case, then I can write the probability of e in and e out minus e out for the g, right? Larger than epsilon larger than epsilon, um, is smaller or equal to, remember we have n hypothesis, so we have n, right, 2e minus 2 epsilon square n, okay? That's the, that's the Hopley equality version of uh, a hypothesis n. Okay, so that's, that's the relation between e and e out. And it's, you can see that we multiply by n, why do we do that? Because the g is chosen from many, many hypotheses in order to fit this data, right? Okay, what about e-test? Well, for the e-test, this g is no longer chosen from a large hypothesis. This g is given. So, rem okay, so here's the, here's, the, here's the thought experiment, right? Imagine you are e-test. So you are this test data. And what, we, what we're doing is I just, somebody sends you a g. This G, you don't know how this G is, but somebody sends you a G. And then test the performance of G on your data. To you, this G is completely given. It's not chosen, you do not choose it from any big set. It's given by somebody else, so it's fixed. So to you, for the E-test, we no longer need this M, okay? This M, we no longer need it. For the test data, we can write the probability of E test minus E out larger than epsilon is smaller than two, the original whole thing equally. Okay. That's right. There's no longer this n. For E in, there's this n here. And the reason is, again, this E in is calculated on a hypothesis that's chosen from many, many hypotheses in order to fit these specific data, all right? 
before you test this hypothesis completely given by somebody else that you never see before. And you do not pick it from other you know, set of large hypotheses in order to fit your data. Your data, this hypothesis never see before. Your data is completely new. You're not using this large model to fit your data. You're just using, you're just see, you're just using it to see how well this particular hypothesis performs. So in that case, there's no longer a need for this large M. So we are we are ending up with this very simple original whole thing inquiry. Now what does that say to us? It says that E out and E in are more far away because we have this M, and this M can be large. Okay? Okay. And so in other words, if we have a large hypothesis, if we have a large model, more complicated model, then E out and E in can be very far away from here. But E test and E out, they are very close because there's no longer this M. Now if if our model is not, not finite, if our model is infinite, then we simply replace this M with the growth function, right? Which, which measures model complexity in infinite uh, sort of hypothesis set. Okay, but anyway, this is model complexity, that's it. Right? So that's the reason, mathematically speaking, why the test data give you a better measure of the underlying E out than the, than the, uh, than the training data, right? Now I'm not saying that the test error, the test data give you, give you the true error, right? Nobody gives you true error. We never know the underlying E out. But the E test, test error is closer to E out than E in. Because your E in, again, is, is on a, on using a hypothesis that's, that's picked from a large set in order to specifically fit the training data. So its performance is no longer accurate to reflect the underlying E out, but the test is a better measure, right? So mathematically, it is that expression, okay? All right. <coughs> okay, so, so much, right? So that's the, uh, that's the basic gist about approximation generalization trade-off. And uh, in essence, well, you can go over the math, you can understand the VC dimension growth function and the d approximation generalization trade-off. You can understand all this from a mathematical point of view, but you can also understand it simply by intuition. And the intuition, like I said before, I, again, again, is very simple. The, you can choose, the more complicated model you choose, the more you are able to fit the data you have on your hand, but the less the, the result correlates with the underlying true error. It can be far away. But the more simple data, you, simple model you choose, the more your result can tell you something about the underlying error, but the less it's, it's able to fit the existing data. So we have this trade-off. And, the, and in practice, that means that we always try with, for, be, for the best data analysis results, you should always try to find out the best complexity. The best complexity is a balance between approximation and generalization, okay? And exactly how to do that, that's going to be something that we talk case by case in many different algorithms that we're going to go over in this semester, All right? Okay, um, on to the next topic, right? So this is the foundation of learning so this is the first topic of learning we have covered. The rest of this lecture, I'm just going to walk over some other concepts right, in our statistical analysis. Now, this is a concept I talk about. Uh, the loss function uh, is a topic that I've already talked about in my introduction. The idea is how do we measure so-called best? Right? How do we measure how much this, this uh, hypothesis fit this data? If I have this data, right? Two, three, these are my data, and I have a hypothesis like that, then this is the error, this is the error, right? I make an error here, I make an error here, I make an <coughs> error everywhere. But how do I calculate how close this hypothesis really is to the data? I need to find a way to combine these errors into something I call the error function. Right? The error function calculates how, how much error I truly make by using this hypothesis function. Okay, so the error function is essentially defined, like I can say the error, right? When I say E out, E in, E, uh, e test, that's the error function. That's just how much the hypothesis, how much error the hypothesis makes. But we haven't formally uh, defined what error function is. The error function essentially is expected expectation of what we call the loss function. Okay? So error function is expected loss function. Loss function. You know, so then the question is, what is the loss function? Well, let me use L to denote a loss function. So suppose I have a hypothesis H. 
This is my hypothesis. Suppose the underlying true relationship is f. Okay. Right. Now the loss function essentially is a measure of how different they are. And see here that the loss function is a function of x, meaning at each x, right? At each uh, x level, at each value of x, how much different they are, right? And the error function is expected loss, meaning I average over all the x. That's actually it, okay? But the loss function is the key idea here. We need, we have, and we have many, it turns out that we have many different loss functions we can define. So one of the loss functions I already talked about is the L2 loss, right? What is L2 loss? Hx minus fx squared, okay? And then you take the expectation that gave you the error function. Now, on, on the observed data, um, actually let me say, uh, the, so what is, um, what is L1 loss? The absolute value of Hx minus fx. Correct? Okay. That's all right. So this is the idea of loss function. Okay. Now let's come back to error function again. The E out, auto sample error of H is defined as the expectation, okay, of the loss function. And the loss function is the difference between H and F. Okay? All right. So this is how much H is different from F. Taken the expectation. And the expectation is taken over x, right? So this is hx, fx. That is the yacht. And this loss function can be defined in many, many different ways, okay? So I'm not going to write anything about it. But this is yacht, out of sample error. So this is expectation is, about, is with respect to the underlying population. What is the yin? What do you mean? The yin h is how much error this h makes on the data you actually observe, right? Okay. So the way to write it is I'm going to sum. So suppose I observe n data, and this is just going to 1 over n, okay? Summation i from 1 to n, h, the loss function of h xi and f xi. Everybody follow that? Okay. So basically, these two. This is the uh, population version. This is the empirical in-sample version. Okay. Right. Now you can also write it. So if we do L2, then what is that? That's simply I, LXI minus FXI squared, right? Okay. So if we do L2, that's the in-sample error. Right. So one of several popular loss function, square squared error loss, which is a square, Z, uh, absolute error loss, which is you know L one, right? This is L two, and this also, uh, this error function I've also talked about, which is the zero one loss, right? This is called a zero one loss because if x is equal to y, then it's one. If x is not equal to y, it's zero, right? So the zero one loss we have also talked about uh, before that produced the mode. Okay, all right. Okay. It turns out that in addition to approximation generalization uh, trade-off, there's another way, probably easier way, uh, for many of you to understand the trade-off, is the bias variance trade-off. The bias variance trade-off is very similar to, to the approximation generalization trade-off. But let's begin with our error function. Suppose we're going to use L2 loss. L2 loss function, then we have E out. Now, this G is our chosen hypothesis, okay? It's the hypothesis that we choose in the end from a big H. So this E out of the uh, of G, I can write it, recall that if we use L2 loss, then the out of sample error is the expectation of your loss function. And the loss function is simply GX minus FX squared, right? Correct? Okay, everybody see that. Now, I can do a little bit algebra. Basically, what I can write is this expectation of this thing square is the variance, right, of this thing, right? Gx minus fx. Okay. The variance of this plus 
the expectation of this, right? Gx minus fx, okay, squared. Everyone agrees? Right. Do people do people do people agree with that? So this is expectation of something squared is equal to variance plus expecting your whole thing squared. Now, the fx is, what is fx? fx is the underlying true relationship. So fx is no variance. It's fixed, okay? True relation. Because it's no variance, I can just get rid of it. Which basically becomes variance of gx. So variance of gx plus, what is this? The expectation of gx minus fx. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it bias. Now this bias is a function of the g, so I'm going to say bias squared, okay? where I define bias. So bias is defined as the expected difference between g and f. Okay. So basically, I go from here to here. The out, of, uh, the out of sample error of a, of a hypothesis G becomes the variance of G plus the bias of G squared. And that's what we call the bias variance decomposition. We can make the out of sample error into two parts. One is called a variance, the other is called a bias. So let's stop here for a second and think about why do we have a variance. So why do we have variance of G? How is G varied? Well, it turns out that here the variance, the meaning of the variance is that every time we use a different data set, so remember we all have the underlying population, right? Have the underlying population of the underlying f. But where does g come from? g come from every time I observe a data set that is picked from the underlying population, I can find, I can choose a g to fit those data points. But every time we observe a different data set, so all these different data sets are drawn from the same underlying population, right? But every time you draw a data set out, the points are going to be different. So every time we have a different data set, we are going to have a different G. Okay? Now the underlying population is the same. But every time I draw some data out, I'm going to be a, I'm going to have a different G. Correct? And that is the variance of G. The bias is on average how much G is different from F. That's the bias. Okay? Let me give you an example. So, suppose again that we have some data sets, right? The underlying population. That's the underlying population. Now, I do not observe the population, but I observe some data points. But every time I draw some data out of the underlying population, my data is going to look different. So suppose the first time I draw some data out, that's the data I see, this is the data I see, okay? So these are the data I see the first time I draw some data out. Now I'm going to fit a linear model. My model is linear. What is the G I pick? Well, this is the G, right? Okay? This is the G that I can fit on these four data points. Now what if the second time I draw a different data set from this population? So we, I no longer draw, I no longer have this point, okay? But suppose that I still have these three points, but now, um, you know, I, I, I find out this point, okay? So now these are the data points I see. If these are the data points I see, what is the G? What is my, in the end, what is my G? Well, it probably goes something like this, right? So you see that every time you draw a different data set out of the population, you end up with a different G, correct? And this is the variance G, okay? Variance G is how much your G change, depending on, uh, you know, depending on the data set you draw from the same underlying population, okay? Now, what is the bias? Bias is bias of G is on average. If you if you do this if you do this a thousand times, ten thousand times, if you do this many many times, and you average all the G, I average all my G together, the average G, how much different it is from the underlying F? Maybe the under so the underlying F here would be um, I don't know what F looks like. So I have these Y data. So F probably looks something like here, right? So this is probably F. Now the idea is if I if I draw data sets out of this population many many numerous times, and I average all my g, do I get this f, or do I get something that's very far away from f? That's bias. 
So bias is on average how close your G is to the F. Variance is how much your G will change depending on different data. Okay. So here's a here's a question. What happens do you think when when I increase my model complexity? Okay. So that's again the question, right? I give you a, if I give you a small H or I give you a really really large H. Okay. Small H versus a large H. Um, what happens to variance and the bias? Let's first talk about bias, okay? Now, these are my underlying data. Okay. These are my underlying data. Um, actually, let, let, me, let, my, let me make my underlying data a little bit more, you know, suppose this is my underlying data. This is my own idea. Uh, if I pick my G from a simple model, like a linear model, what do you think the bias, you know, let's calculate the bias. Or if I pick my G from a really complicated model and I calculate bias, which one do you think the bias is smaller? Well, every time, the answer is complicated model, okay? More complicated model has smaller bias, why? Because if you have more complicated model, anytime you observe, you know, even if even if we only observe a few data at a single time, it is able again to find a model that is closer to the underlying F. But if I use but but if I use a linear model, then again, given these data points, I can only calculate, I can only get something like this that is far away from the F. It's, it's that simple, okay? The more complicated your model is, the more it, the more it is able, the, you know, the more possible it is to find out some relationship of G, average G on average that is closer to the NIF. But there's a, but the trade-off here again, again, the trade-off, right? The trade-off from this perspective is if you increase the model complexity, then your variance will go up very, very fast. Why? Let's take a look at again this example, you know, Maybe let's change the example here. So, okay, underlying data. Now, I observe these points. Okay. I observe these points. This is one data set. The other data set is I get rid of this point and I have this point, okay? So that's a second data point, data set. In the first data set, if I use a, if I use a linear model, my G looks something like this. Now, if I get rid of this point and I change to this point, what does my G look like? My G will look something like this, okay? Now, the variance is not that much in this case. Well, there is variance, but not that much. However, if I use a really complicated model, then in the first case, my model will look something like this. In the second case, my model will look something like this, okay, right? And they're going to be very different for a large part of the data area. So in other, in other words, the variance become much larger. Right? Now this is also because the more complicated your model is, the more it is easily influenced by any change in the data points. Because, because the more complicated model is, the more it is able to fit all your data, right? So once your data change a little bit, it's going to completely change your shape in order to fit all those data. So the variance become much, much larger. Now again, the out of sample error is a combination of two. It's a combination of variance and the bias. So if you use a more complicated data uh, model, you're able to get a smaller bias in most cases, right? You're able to drive down the bias because you're able to get closer and closer to the true underlying F because the true underlying F oftentimes has a you know, pretty complicated shape. So you're able to get closer and closer to the underlying F, but again, you're also extremely vari variable. I change the data point and you become completely different, right? On average, you, you, you can come closer to the F, but in you know, any individual data sets, you become extremely varied your results, and so the variance become larger. So in the end, the E out may not be better, right? So again, we have this extremely familiar relationship that, uh, okay? We have the extremely familiar relationship. Again, that's the same thing as approximation generation trade-off. Here is the more complex your model is, the smaller the bias but then the variance will quickly go up. And the auto sample error, or the total error, is really the combination of two. So we want to find, again, the minimum point here. 
So the bias variance trade-off is simply another expression of the approximation generalization trade-off. Same thing, right? The idea is simple. You increase model complexity, you sacrifice one thing, you gain another thing. And in the middle, that's where we want to find. Okay. Now let's take a look at an example. Right. So uh, here I'm going to assume that the underlying true relationship is y equal to fx equal to sine x. Okay, sine pi x. So the relation between y and x is a sine. Right. Okay. Um, right. So this is the true underlying f. Okay. And I'm going to consider two different models. The first model, the, the second model is a linear model. Everybody familiar? Ax plus b. The first model is even simpler. The first model is a constant model, which says we only, you know, it's just a constant, okay? It's just a b. How well do these two models perform? This is simple, this is complicated, right? It's a linear model, but compared to this one, it's more complicated. So, simple, complicated. Which one is better for this underlying f? Well, it turns out that the question, the answer is different depends on how many data you have. So initially, let's suppose we on, I only have two data points. So every time I only have two data points. Okay, now, suppose I have these two data points, then the constant model will give you this fit, right? Correct? If I have these two data points, then the linear model will give you this fit, correct? Now, suppose I draw two data points, two data points, two data points, many, many times. Every time I draw the different two points, two data points, from this underlying F, what happens? Like this, okay? <laughs> so every time I have two, if, you know, so if I draw these two data points, it gives me a fit like this, constant model. If I draw these two, it gives me a fit like this, right? So if you do this numerous times, this becomes all my G, correct? for the constant model. Now here, this is a linear model. So every time I have these two data points, they give me a line, every two data points, they give me a line. So if I do this numerous times, it becomes something like this. Then I'm going to calculate the bias and the variance. How do I calculate the variance? Very simple, the variance is how much they vary, right? Okay, and what is the bias? The bias is on average, if I average all the G. So if I average all the G, it give me, it give me this one, okay? So this red line is the average G. So I'm going to calculate how this average G differs from this F. That's the bias. Here, if I average everything, that gave me this red line. And this, the difference between this red line and this blue line is my bias for the linear model. Okay? So here are the results. For the constant model, bias is 0.5, variance is 0.25. For the linear model, bias is 0.21, variance is 1.69. Now, you, know, you don't have to worry about the units, right? I mean, it's just, but we only care about, you know, relatively, relative which one is larger. So you can see that the bias, which one has a larger bias? Which one? The constant model. Because on average, this G, this G, average G looks more different than from the, from the blue line than this average G, okay? So this average G is closer. So the linear model has a smaller bias, but which one has the larger variance? The linear model has a much larger variance, right? So 0.25 versus 1.69. So in the end, which model is better? The linear model is better or the constant model is better? The constant model is better because the E out, the out of sample error, like the error we truly care about, is a combination of bias and variance. So if you add them together, E out here is 0.275 and the E out here is 1.9, okay? Now, for those of you who are keeping a close attention to details, you will say that's not right. It should not be, it should not be 0.5 plus 0.25. It should be 0.25 plus 0.5 squared. Well, actually here the bias is bias squared, all right? So let me just clarify that, right? If you're keeping attention to detail, that's very good of you. So the E out is 0.7 here, E out is 1.9 here. So the constant model is the best one here, okay? So simple model wins in this case. However, what if we have five data points? So every time I take on not two points, but I take on five data points. Now, look at, look at the constant model, look at, the, look at the, uh, the linear model. The constant model gives you this kind of variance, this kind of G, every time you have five data points, all right? And uh, we have this G, this G on average, you have a kind of bias. Now, the bias doesn't change, actually. The 
The bias doesn't change because the bias is the result of average g, the difference between average g and the f. So here, if I, because here, yes, I only have two data points. But if I can take out two data points at a time, numerous times, in the end, and I average them, then in the end, it's the same thing as I take out five data points at a time and average them in the end, because I take out numerous data points, okay, always. So the bias doesn't change. In other words, you can see that a bias is really a reflection not of how many data points you have, but of how close your model can, can <coughs> capture the underlying true f. Okay, if your model is too simple, it doesn't capture the underlying f, the bias will be large, regardless of how many data points you have, right? So the bias doesn't change, but the variance becomes smaller. Okay, so here the variance is 2.25, here the variance is 0.1. Why does the variance become smaller? Because now we have more data points. So the fits become more stable. How about here, the linear model? Now you can see, again, the bias doesn't change, but the variance becomes much, much, much smaller, right? Because now every time you take out five points and you fit a linear model. So the result becomes much more stable than this one, right? And so the variance here becomes 0.21, okay? Still larger than the constant model, but already much, much smaller. So now if you add them together and you calculate E out, here E out is 0.6, here E out is 0.42. Which one wins? The linear model wins. So here the more complicated model wins, right? Now here, so we have two situations. In one situation, the, the simple model wins. In another situation, the complicated model wins. They both have the same bias variance trade-off, right? We see the bias variance trade-off here on, in both cases. Here, the more, in both cases, the more complicated models have lower bias and higher variance. But, in, in, but when you have little data, very little data, then here, the variance increases very fast with more complicated model. If you have more data, then the variance increases slower, right? with more complicated model. So the more complicated model is more likely to win if you have more data, right? Because in the end, what we care is E out is a combination of bias and the variance, okay? Now, uh, that brings us to, we can, say the, we can say exactly the same thing using the, uh, using the VC generalization bound. So look at here, right? So remember, bias variance trade-off is just another way of expressing the same idea as generalization approximation trade-off, which is the VC generalization bound. So here, let's look at the VC generalization bound, right? Two things determine how good your E and E out are, right? One thing is your VC dimension. VC dimension is, is the complexity of model. The other thing is N, how many data points you have. So if you want your model to be, if you want your E out to be really, really close to your E, there are two things we can do. One thing is you can choose a simpler model. The VC dimension goes down. Okay, if you choose a simpler model, your E and E out become closer. Or another thing you can do is simply increase the number of data points, right? Just increase n. If you increase n, this bound becomes smaller. So that bring, that gives me that, that says the, essentially the lesson here. Uh, so this essentially explains the situation we just observed, which is if you want to choose a more complicated model, and you still want it to perform very very well, then in, instead of changing VC dimension, change your model you can simply go to a higher and larger n. Or in other words, if you have a large data set, if your n is really large, then you can afford to choose a more complicated model without the VC, without the generalization bound become very bad. Okay? Right. So remember our trade-off here. The trade-off here is that choosing a more complicated model give you a smaller E in, but, the, but, but, but E out become worse. Now, if you have a really large data set, then even if you choose a very complicated model, this is still very small. So your E out is still very close to your E, but then you can get E in really, really down to zero. So your model becomes the best model, right? Okay, so in other words, when we choose which model is the best for our purpose, it relies on two things, right? We need to consider both the model, how much the model complexity really captures the underlying end. Right? So I will, I will talk about this message again and again, but when you are trying to choose the best model, two things you need to consider. The number one is, how, what is the underlying F really looks like? You have, to, you have to guess. If the underlying F is really complicated, then if you choose a simple model, the bias is going to be large, right? The bias is going to be large. Even if the variance is small, the bias is too large. So you need to choose a complicated model to match the underlying F so that you can drive the bias down, even if that means the variance go up, right? There's this trade-off. The other thing is how many data points you have. The more data points, 
the more you can afford to go to a high, more complicated model. If your, if your data points is too small, you cannot do complicated model, okay? Even if the underlying F is, is even if the underlying F is really complicated, you, and you, you have to choose a simple model because otherwise the variance will be too large, otherwise this bound will be just too loose, right? But if you have a lot of N, if N is really large, then you don't have to care, you don't have to worry about VC dimension that much. You don't have to worry about model compensation that much. Choose a complicated model because it will drive E in very low and you still get a very tight bound. Uh, so that brings us to, um, to the application of like, choosing model in reality, right? In our everyday exercise applications. Oftentimes, so you know, people uh, you people hear about what uh, uh, what people have been doing uh, in uh, machine and deep learning, especially especially deep learning, where people are building huge, like, huge uh, neural networks, very deep multi-layer uh, neural networks with millions of parameters, in uh, in, in vision recognition and other uh, and text recognition in those fields, right? So the the rea the reason why they are able to build a hugely complicated model when they're doing deep, deep, deep very deep, to very deep uh, neural networks is because, why? Well, one of the reasons because they have huge amount of data because image data is very, very plenty. So the numerous data you can use to essentially estimate your model. Now, a model as complex as a deep, many deep networks today have millions of parameters, like I said. So you're estimating millions of parameters. How do you ever do that? If you do that on a, on a very limited data set, if you have like 1,000 data, okay, 5,000 data, you will never be able to get any good result. Your result will be meaningless. Why? Because even if you can fit every data, you can fit every data point, your e in will be zero. But this generalization bound will be huge because you have a huge VC dimension. You have a huge model, complicated model, and your n is not big enough. But now, if you have millions and, and tens of millions of data, your n is really large, then you can do truly complicated model and don't have to worry about how, how, how model, or worry less about how well your model generalized to the underlying QM, right? So, so again, the choice of model depends on the number of data you have, okay? Now it also depends on the, what you believe about the underlying F, like I just said. So in, in many applications of deep learning, the underlying F is incredibly complicated by itself, okay? So if you wanna to try to recognize an image, then image data is, the pattern in the image is incredibly complicated. The underlying F is very complicated. So you, there's no way you, you can never use a linear model to do that, right? That's just too simple. The bias would be too large. So you, so in image recognition, you both need a very complicated model and you need a huge amount of data in order to train it, in order to get any sensible results. Right? Now in economics, on the other hand, the situation in economics is that we have in many situations, in many phenomena that we study in economics, we also have very complicated underlying F. So many economic situations, right, uh, behavior probably should have very complicated underlying mechanism that should manifest themselves as very complicated relationship between variables. But unfortunately, in economics, we don't have large data, right? So economics, our data so far has been very, very limited data. Now, without a big data set, and do you, use a, do you use a complicated model or do you use a linear regression, right? Now it turns out that if your data is not big enough, oftentimes it's true that linear regression probably is your best friend. Because for that limited data, you should really go for a simple model, like the constant, like, you know, like the case of constant versus linear model here. If your model is only two data points, you choose the constant. Because in that case, it gives you a better E out in the end, right? So that's the message I will talk about again, 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 right? So don't, so in other words, don't go and you don't go and learn any complicated fancy uh, models and the methods, and then just mindlessly use on your on your on your data set, right? If your data set, if your number of data do not support that, then that's a very bad practice. Okay, so I hope that's the one message that you get today. Okay, um, so we talk about that, and I think are we running out of time? Yeah. I actually don't. Are we supposed to end by six ten or six? Because we finished 10 minutes early, right? 10 minutes early is 6, 10, or 6? 6, 6, 10, okay, thank you, okay. So I have been finishing too early, right, previously? Okay, um, all right, so I have three minutes left. Um, I'll try to begin.
Okay. All right, so so far, uh, remember at the beginning I said uh, we have two kinds of y. y kind, one kind of y is y just equal to fx, right? We have been assuming that in some of the examples we have. Now in this case, we say y is a noiseless, meaning that y is completely determined by x. If y is completely determined by x, then all we need to do is to learn this x, okay? Like this, okay? Like, um, my, if y is sine x, sine pi x, then this is the f, and we just need to learn this f. But in reality, in almost 100% of the cases we consider, in most cases we consider, y is not completely determined by x. Like if you, you know, give you x, you cannot really pin down y, right? But there are still many, many possibilities. So in other words, in reality, we have something like this, right? So this is x, 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 x. So, okay, x. So at each level, at each point of x, y, there are still many different y values possible, okay? So now, if I give you x and you tell me y looks like this, then y is completely determined by x. In this case, we call y a noiseless target. But in reality, in most cases, I give you x, you cannot really pin down the value y because there's still many, many different possible values of y. Even I give you x. That's, the, that's true for major other cases. In this case, we say y is a noisy, okay? Noisy target. Right? This is, this is, there's some noise. I give you x, there's a, there's a bunch of different y. Now, in this case, what we do is instead of learning something called fx, we have to learn something called py given x, okay? In order to predict y, clear? Because if I give you, say, suppose I say x equal to four, you still do not know what y is, okay? x equal to four, there are still many different possible y values. So instead of just saying that, look, there is something called y equal to fx, I'm going to say, look, I give you x, you tell me what the probability distribution of y given this x. And then let's try to find out what this is. All right, so for the previous part of the lecture, I've been talking about how to find out fx. We're learning a target function. Right? f is a function, we're learning a target function. For the next class, I'm going to talk about how to find out the target, a target distribution. Okay? So when y is now completely determined by x, what we're going to do is find, what we're going to do is try to learn a target distribution rather than a target function. And how to do that? I think I'm running out of time, so we'll continue on Thursday, okay? All right.